Marijuana. What happens to our bodies from a scientific point of view when we use cannabis? Welcome to the Geopop series on the effects of drugs. A series to understand precisely how drugs work and what might be the possible damage that they can cause. Yes, because we feel that the more people are aware of all that, the easier it might be to steer clear of them. Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers. We are Italians. It was manually translated into English, but dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. Well, let's start by saying that if we eat cannabis in fluorescences, so the flowers in their raw form, it will have no significant effect on our bodies. We will not experience the so-called psychotropic effects. The key element that unlocks the active components is heat. What do you mean by heat? When cannabis is burned, what happens is that the THCA, the primary active component, which is actually not yet active, becomes active by undergoing a transformation into THC. If we ate uncooked marijuana cakes, it wouldn't do anything. The little cakes, the so-called brownies, have a psychotropic effect because they have been baked, and so the THCA has lost an A and has become THC, specifically by losing a molecule of carbon dioxide. But now the question is, once it enters the bloodstream, what happens to our bodies from a biochemical perspective? I'll hand over to our chemist, Dana. Okay, wait a second, Andrea, because in addition to THC, there is also another substance present called CBD. The interesting thing is that THC and CBD have the exact same molecular formula, c 21 h 3 2 However, despite this, they produce completely different effects to each other. This is because THC is much more psychoactive and acts more at the cerebral level compared to CBD. These differences in effect are due to a small difference in their molecular structures, rather than to the formula itself. THC, you see, has an oxygen atom that forms a closed ring in this particular region, whereas the CBD molecule has an open ring in the same area. And this difference, although it is small, is of utmost importance. So what are the effects of THC and CBD on our bodies? Well, one of the first visible effects of THC is that our eyes become red. This phenomenon is due to vasodilation. In simple terms, the blood vessels dilate to allow a greater flow of blood. The capillaries in the sclera, the white part of the eye, also dilate and become visible to the naked eye. Other possible effects of THC are tachycardia or bradycardia, which are an increase or a slowing down of the heart rate, but also chemical hunger, the so-called munchies, a seemingly unreasonable increase in appetite, which also involves a heightened sense of aromas and flavors. These are the primary effects that occur from a physical perspective. From a psychological point of view, THC can have a negative impact on learning, concentration, memory, tension, as well as our balance and reflexes. Simply put, it's as if our thoughts and body movements are slowed down. CBD, however, with its different chemical structure, has no psychoactive effects on brain function. It affects other aspects, such as pain modulation and muscle relaxation. However, what is the biochemical mechanism through which these two molecules exert their effects on our bodies? How do they achieve these effects? At the exact moment the smoke is inhaled, the substances present in marijuana and cannabis enter the bloodstream through the lungs. In a matter of seconds, the THC and CBD, along with all the other substances, reach the heart and are pumped throughout the body, including the brain. Before they can enter the brain, however, the THC and CBD need to cross the blood-brain barrier. In simple terms, it is a barrier that protects the brain from harmful substances. THC and CBD, however, are easily able to cross this barrier thanks to their lipophilic nature, that is, their ability to mix with fats. Well, once the THC and CBD have access to the whole body, they can begin to demonstrate their effects. Let's enter the brain. Here, as you can see, there are a lot of neurons, about 100 billion of them, which communicate with each other. And to do this, between one neuron and another, the so-called neurotransmitters are released, the messenger molecules, these purple ones that you see here. Well, once it enters the brain, the THC approaches the neurons and binds to a specific receptor, the CB1 receptor, and it does it much better than anandamide, a substance naturally produced by our body does. So imagine the receptor as a kind of socket, and the THC attaches or fits much more effectively than the molecules we already produce. 
By binding to the CB1 receptor, the THC modifies the release of the neurotransmitters, the messenger substances, and by modifying the release of these substances, specific effects will occur depending on where receptors are. If the THC binds to receptors in the area of the brain called the hippocampus, Effects associated with learning and memory will occur, whereas if it reaches the cerebellum, it will interfere with motor coordination and balance. The famous chemical hunger, the munchies instead, results from the activation of receptors present both in the hypothalamus, another area of the brain, and in the stomach and intestines. Yes, because CB1 receptors are found throughout the body, not just in the brain. So the THC, by binding to these receptors, causes the production of the hunger hormone ghrelin, which will increase appetite and thirst and enhance our sense of taste and smell. Finally, the THC could also bind to receptors in the parts of the cardiovascular system, such as the heart, arteries and veins, inducing a change in heart rate and thus causing a slight tachycardia or bradycardia. Okay, well, generally speaking, that was the mechanism of action of THC. On the other hand, CBD, precisely because of the small structural difference we saw earlier, binds much less to CB1 receptors. Actually, it produces completely different effects. We've already mentioned that it can reduce pain and it can also reduce anxiety which is why it's often used in medicine. By and large, its mechanism of action is not yet well understood, and studies are still ongoing to determine what effects it might have on the human body. In conclusion, it is important to emphasize that multiple studies, as confirmed by the World Health Organization, WHO, have consistently shown that the extensive and prolonged consumption of this substance, particularly during adolescence, can lead to various problems related to learning, learning and memory functions. Until the age of 21, in fact, the brain is still growing and the intake of THC as an adolescent can lead to problems with brain development. Furthermore, the WHO emphasizes that if an adolescent grows up in a family environment where there have already been cases of psychosis and the adolescent consumes cannabis, there is a higher chance that they will develop psychological problems. So in predisposed subjects, the onset of psychosis is more likely. However, it must be said that regarding whether it is lethal or not, there have never been any cases of death due to cannabis use. The cannabinoid receptors those that Dena showed you are not present in the areas of the brain that control cardiovascular and respiratory functions, and therefore THC cannot induce cardiac arrests, for example. In practice, it is not possible to die from a cannabis overdose. That said, thanks a lot for watching us until the end. See you in the next episode, always here on Geopop, Everyday Science. Ciao!